folks. Who's hungry? <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, well, um, this is what I can promise, is that uh, while we are going through this talk about how uh, Uber scales uh, fast and furious fashion and yet in a safe fashion across a very distributed marketplace, you will be hearing um, the challenges we face and uh, how we plan to overcome those challenges. We have overcome many. Uh, if you are an Uber uh, rider, you would know how the app has become more stable, how how things have started becoming more relevant, how, uh, how drivers are happier working with us. Uh, so hopefully, uh, you will forget your hunger for the next 20 minutes, and you will be able to enjoy the challenges we are here to present. Uh, quick introduction, Ritesh, you want to go first? Hi, I'm Ritesh Agrawal. I'm a lead data scientist for intelligent infrastructure. So uh, at Uber, we are trying to make a uh, rethink about the infrastructure, mostly uh, we don't want the infrastructure to be static. It should be more dynamic. It should be adaptive to the business. And that's where uh, we have created this uh, big team around intelligent infrastructure, where we are trying to leverage AI, machine learning, data science, anything to just make the, the uh, infrastructure more adaptive or uh, reliable. And I lead that team. So. Um, uh, for me, um, I'm a product manager in Uber. I um, drive Uber's reliability strategy across uh, all of infrastructure. Uh, I'm very passionate about making sure that whatever the great features we develop across uh, our headquarters and other centers, we, we make it very quickly in the hands of our users so that the users can enjoy uh, and uh, have more fun. If this clicker works, that would be great. Why is it so important to be fast and furious? Right, and uh, as you can imagine, that um, you can. Th there are many ways to look at this, right? You can look at opinions. People say feature X is better than feature Y. Uh, but you can look at opinions for people saying that, hey, maybe you should connect uh, riders to drivers sooner. Maybe you should pick up uh, riders and drivers from different regions, and maybe you should start rating them and connect them based on a rating system. Many ideas, many opinions across the company. But which one do you choose, right? What do you need to do? Uh, you don't understand. There's, there's not that many ride-sharing companies you can go back. There are no case studies. There are no manuals which tells Uber that you know this is the right way to build a very global, massive, distributed marketplace. What should you do? You experiment, right? You find out a way by which you can experiment. Okay. <laughs> I'll use this. The clicker is uh, creating more trouble. Uh, you do experiment. Right? You, you do your A-B test, uh, and you then come up with the features. And now when you have the features, and you know that the feature is going to make you more money, right? What, what's the next thing you try to do? You roll it out. right? You have to roll it out quickly. You might be losing millions of dollars uh, by holding on to your features and not rolling it out quickly enough to your customers. So it's very important to understand that why, why do we need to be fast and furious? Because, because our marketplace is changing. Our marketplace is very distributed. Well, 600 cities, 64 countries, millions of trips, millions of riders, hundreds and thousands of drivers are actually relying on our marketplace. We like it or not, they wake up and they, few of them are actually going to work, commute, few of them are actually making their daily livelihood by driving for Uber. So we might as well be very serious about not only being fast and furious uh, to make sure that the features are delivered properly, but also being safe about it, right? Now, it's very funny when you look at the numbers that how many code changes? It's 1,200 code changes, right, on a monthly basis. And you're looking at like 20,000 configuration changes, right? The configuration changes drive everything. It, it's a, you can think of a very hyper local marketplace here, distributed and tuned towards the cities. Without those configurations, it's very hard to make progress for Uber. Now, being fast and furious means performing at high velocity means that we need to take our features, we need to take our configurations, we need to take our code devs, and we need to roll it out quickly to the users, to your apps, to the distributed systems, to our infrastructure. Velocity. Velocity is the name of the game. Velocity intrinsically causes reliability issues. We are seeing it all the time. The three metrics to consider here are availability. Where are you able to complete a trip? Where are you able to come, uh, hail a ride? Latency, how long did it take for you to flow through the system to call the ride? How did the screen, uh, screens transition? How did, how did the taps function? And the third one is accuracy. How about the data you got back? Was the map accurate? Was the pricing accurate? Was the discount accurate? Now, this graph here shows um, 
a, a, a rough correlation of what's going on. So if you look at the red line, that's the total uh, configuration changes that we have been rolling out over a period of time. The data uh, dates back to January 2018 here. And the bars indicate the number of user-facing incidents that we have been tracking. There's, there's, a, there's a strong correlation. It's not very correlated, like it's, it's not like a 0.99, but you can well imagine that it's almost like a 0.8 or a 0.9 there of how the speed and the velocity by which you actually deliver changes to your user directly matters and changes how reliable your service is. Not just about the app, not just about the infrastructure, all together, whole as a service. So, which means that being able to detect user-facing incidents and being able to attribute that back to the code so that people can quickly go and fix it and roll it out furiously is the most important thing for us. And it's very challenging. This was me. This is a personal account. Uh, this is me in Paris um, last July, 2018 July, was uh, uh, vacationing with my family. And this is what I saw. Right, A product manager at Uber opens up the Uber app, very proud of what I'm doing there, my first uh, trip to France. And you can see that the map did not load. OK, all right, two minutes have passed by. The map did not load. It's instructing me that I have to walk a little bit for me to pick up and meet my ride. Where do I walk without the map? I'm just, I'm just stranded there. Wife is staring at me. Kids have given up, right? Now, when you take something like that, of course you can catch it, right? Of course you can catch the fact that you delivered something unexpected or a fatal experience back to the user, right? And you can catch it in your dashboard. Fantastic. What's the KPI there? A time to detect. How quickly were you able to see that something like this happened? Now, the more difficult part. Would you be able to take that anomaly and relate it back to code? Because if you don't do that, it doesn't matter how many of these we are reporting, you won't be able to be fast and furious. It's not happening. You are observing, you are worried about it, you are talking about it, you are calling up people, but you are not able to deliver a fix soon enough to the marketplace and correct that problem. That's what we want to talk about. And, you know, what happens? I mean, how much, what, what is at stake here, right? Globally distributed marketplace, 600 cities, just reminding you folks, okay? This is how the cost curve looks like, okay? When we are able to detect issues lower down, at the developer workstation, in our CI-CD pipeline, the cost is nearly zero. Single digit, two digit numbers there. The moment we are able to detect issues during the rollout phase, the cost starts rising. And the time to detect actually rises because you're not able to reach statistical significance during your employee testing and dog fooding testing, right? So there is, a, there is a big opportunity here to be able to do a really good strategy where you are able to roll it out fast and furious to your population, have really good systems to be able to detect as fast as possible, have a really good system to be able to attribute it back to code as fast or and configuration as fast as possible, fix it and roll out the mitigation as fast as possible, right? I mean, how many times did I use the word fast, right? You can well imagine that there's too many fast in there, right? You, you must be giving something up, right? The question is, we don't want to give something up. We don't want to give it up, and that's why we believe that science-driven tech would be able to bring us to a stage where we can reduce the blast radius of all those bad experiences. Instead of one million people seeing the map not loading, we can detect it at 10,000, and quickly find it a part of the code or the configuration that made the change, roll it out, fix it, thereby reducing the blast radius of that problem that we created. And Ritesh is here to talk about it more. So he's going to talk about safety. Remember the two KPIs we talked about, time to detect and time to resolve, and make sure you hold him accountable <laughs> at the end of his presentation on those two KPIs. Hi. So it's interesting, uh, Ananda just explained his KPI. As a project manager, he is concerned with two KPIs. Can we reduce uh, time to detect and can we reduce uh, time to resolve? From a data science perspective, I find this very interesting. It's like, how do you take this now vague problem and convert it into a concrete actionable item? So one of the first thing you always want to do as a data scientist is, OK, understand the system better. Uh, so we started looking into this problem, trying to understand, OK, what are the sources of errors? And uh, this actually involved a lot of manual work. Every time there's a, any kind of incidents, uh, there's a post-mortem report. 
going through these post model uh, report, we started uh, analyzing, okay, what is the source of error, and came up with this uh, kind of distribution. Okay, 40% are related code changes. What was surprising is a big percentage, 20% is related configuration changes. And we realized that makes sense because there are 20,000 configuration changes happening on a daily, ba uh, on a monthly basis. And the challenge is there's one person who is uh, building the code, who is putting all these configuration in place, and then you have a city operations team that are actually making the configuration changes. So there's a big disconnect people who are writing these configurations and people who are using these configurations, and they don't really share uh, essentially how these configuration works. And sometimes there are dependencies. So the next thing, uh, uh, we wanted to understand more about the configuration itself. So here's an interesting thing. Do you think about this uh, two images of the Uber app? Are they, uh, is it the same app or is it a different app? What do you feel, uh, is it the same or different? So it's same, I mean, yeah. But what is interesting about this is there are so many differences. For example, the product choice that you have is different because one is, uh, you have, uh, one is from the San Francisco and other is from Delhi. So in San Francisco, you have a choice of e-bike, whereas in uh, Delhi, you have a choice of auto. So the product choice keeps on changing. That is all driven by configuration. So over here, basically every time the app opens up, based on the location, uh, it will ask, this is a Delhi, do I show e-bike? Yes, no. Do I show auto? Yes. So it's constantly calling all these configurations. Uh, other thing you notice is like promotions. Promotions are driven by configurations. Even how we show the route map, uh, if it's a Uber pool, then you show a direct line. If it's a auto or something, you show actual route. So there's, in a map, there's uh, thousands of configurations that actually make it customized. So uh, um, one of the advantage of configuration is basically it allows you to build a global app, but at the same time optimize it for local uh, city performances. The other uh, thing it uh, gives you experimentation ability. Whenever you're doing experimentation, you're essentially putting a configuration and the code flows changes. But uh, it creates a challenge. Uh, challenge is that uh, configurations are hard to review. It's not a, like a code uh, deployment where you have diff reviews. There are complex dependencies. As I was saying, a uh, developer creates a configuration, uh, city operations uses the uh, uh, configurations. And then uh, it gets immediately rolled out. As soon as someone makes a change in the configuration property, it's like a database change, and immediately all over the world, people will uh, see this new configuration. And things become even more interesting when we talk about Uber scale. So we have essentially a microservice. We have like 3,000 plus microservices and 1,000 plus configuration changes happening up every day. So this was the problem scope that we are dealing with. And then we started looking, OK, how exactly are developers and engineers are uh, finding the problem? And this is what uh, they were doing. So whenever any configuration changes, or they constantly have these dashboards where they monitor like how many 500 errors they have observed, what is the P95 latency of a service, and how many requests they are uh, getting uh, on the backend side. So we started uh, thinking, OK, what is the problem with this current approach? F one, you have people manually looking at these dashboards. They have certain ideas about the what is the thresholds they should look at. But it's all uh, based on very domain, ex uh, domain experience and uh, very manual effort. So we wanted to automate this. Can we leverage these signals and build a, a more uh, data science product that can automatically tell whether it's, there has been a regression? Uh, by regression, I mean there's a, uh, the quality of the app has degraded. So we took, for example, then we started about like uh, using standard uh, practices in uh, uh, data science. We took one of the signal, and uh, let's say you make a configuration change at this point. Then what we do is we observe how the particular signal is behaving in the next uh, few minutes. And this difference becomes our time to detect. Uh, so let's say in the next five minutes, we will see how the uh, signal is behaving. And then that becomes our treatment. And then we use the previous time before the signal, uh, the configuration change was made as our control. And we conduct an A-B testing. 
So that uh, tells whether the regression has happened or not. Let's say in this particular uh, case, the signal says uh, that there's no regression. But how do we trust this signal? That is uh, one problem, because the signal inherently might be very noisy. So there's this uh, another idea of AA test that we started leveraging in this particular case, is we know previously that there was no outage. Let's say two hours before, there was no uh, incidents was reported. So we look at that uh, uh, prior time period and conduct another AA test. And this tells us how reliable the signal might be. Now, the challenge is this work uh, nicely. The problem is this doesn't have a high coverage. So how do you m get more coverage? So we started adding more signals. Uh, we started P95 latency, crash rate, and few others based on what developers were already using. Now, it created another problem. How do we now make a decision based on so many different signals, whether the regression has been uh, uh, happening or not? That requires an ensemble approach. So we started looking into ensembling all these different signals. Now, the ch another challenge we created for ourselves is if you're having these so many signals, there will be a lot of correlated signals. And you don't want to uh, increase your weights um, just by the correlated signal. So, the v so we started using a PCA as a way to determine whether the signals are correlated or not. And this gives us a, a nice framework, a general framework where we can easily add more signals as required and keep on improving our coverage as well as precision. So, uh, finally, I mean, uh, from this we have learned a lot of things. Uh, one of the things uh, is customization is necessary to being fast and furious, but at the same time you have to focus on reliability and the goal should be then that you improve both customization but also reliability. The second thing is incidents will occur. The key is can you detect an incident as soon as possible? That time to detect an incident uh, should be one of the KPI that you're focusing. One interesting, the third uh, interesting thing that we learned is there's law, uh, developers, and when you're uh, deploying an ML solution at infrastructure level, you don't want to start with a completely new system. You want to uh, assist, uh, leverage what developers and engineers are already using and try to automate that. The bigger challenge is because when uh, a regression, we, when the data science uh, model says there's a regression, uh, the a notification uh, and alert will be going back to the engineers. And the engineer should be able to understand what uh, exactly the data science model is doing. So you should be able to tie exam back to the signals that an uh, engineer can understand. And then eventually the engineer can uh, tie that back to uh, uh, actual source of the code where uh, the problem is happening. And lastly, this is more from Anando, I guess, uh, from business perspective. Do you want to talk now? About the last well, ROI is important, right? We like it or not, you always have to look at the fact that uh, the amount of investment you are making on your science, the amount of investment that you are making for your infrastructure costs, for training, for deployment, and then how many outages are you are you capturing, and how good is your uh, blast radius reduction, right? If you cannot, if if it is a one-way, it cannot be a one-way road, right? Any any attempt to say that, oh, we are going to be very science-driven and we are going to invest a lot of money uh, in building up this infrastructure without tying it back to an ROI, uh, it's trouble, right? It won't sell for long. Yes, you can do some fancy projects like those, but it's, there will, won't be a long-term solution that the marketplace can leverage. Uber happens to be a one a very transactional app, right? You open app, you do a transaction, and you go away. So we are we are very fortunate there, and we are able to relate our efforts back to a dollar number always, because there's a high chance that when you are opening up the app, you are probably going to take a ride, right? So not not like uh, some other social media or other types of apps where your your per instance. Um, uh, customer value is not clear. It's very clear on us, right? Every session is very clear on us. So that, is, that has been the guiding light for us. We invest, uh, but we look at a clear ROI, and this is, I think, that uh, is very important to, um, for us to internalize that a, a data science effort, an AI ML-based effort, um, and we just talked about maybe 
0.5% of what's going on, right? It's a huge infrastructure. The, the, the general framework is large, has many different solutions to it, and we have a summary diagram. But when you look at a system like those, if you don't keep ROI in mind, it's not going to be sustainable. It's not going to pay back for the investment uh, that it has been made. I'm, I know I'm preaching to the uh, choir here, but uh, I feel that it's important, and that's what has been the guiding light for us at Uber. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much.